Well, hello, my beautiful people. How are you? I hope you are doing well. Welcome to A Level of True Crime. All right, you guys, this is going to be very interesting. I found a little something and I was like, what? It just stopped me in my tracks and made me really think about things. And I'm like, I got to show the family this. This is just too much. So without further to do, Fair use disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purpose such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. And fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty by a court of law. Everything shared in this video is based on speculation and is alleged. As always, everything said is simply an opinion. So my thumbnail, you guys, is they knew. They knew. But the question is, what did they knew? <laughs> what did they knew? And how soon did they knew it? <laughs> <laughs> There's some grammar police out there that just had a heart attack. All right, so let's get into this. Do you folks remember when the two surviving roommates got the tattoos, right? For Maddie, Kaylee, Zanna, and Ethan. And it, it was meant like a love you always and forever, right? Do you remember that? It's right here, okay? So they got these tattoos um and it was a tribute to the surviving roommates and i want you to listen to this i'm gonna mute for you guys get ready bro i got some new evidence oh yeah i bet you do the crimes in the indictment are listed in the order in which they were committed i bet you didn't know that i did not know that so first we got some burglary because he broke in the house then we got maddie and then kaylee and then Xana. And then Ethan. That ain't right. I thought Ethan was killed in the hallway and Xana was fighting back. Well, no, you were wrong. But good thing for you, you have me to figure it out. Here we go. If all your friends just got brutally murdered in the house, would the first thing you'd do be to like call up your friend and be like, hey, you wanna get a tattoo? Let's call up some tattoo shops and make some appointments and try to make this all about us. Did you see the Instagram post? Yeah, everyone. And how did the roommates know the order in which they were killed? M K X E. So, let's go back and look at the date. November 24th. And they were married. They were married. They were murdered on the 13th. So, exactly 11 days after. And they happened to get tattooed in the exact order of allegedly the deaths that occurred. It was Maddie, then Kaylee, then Zanna, and then Ethan. So, that... I was just like, what in the actual hell? Because even law enforcement didn't even at that time know that. That just astounds me. Does that not freak you guys out? Scott Stuff says that's freaking wild. At that time, what we were led to believe 11 days after is that these roommates were sound asleep on the very first floor, the very bottom level. And so we were all kind of like, huh, all right, hmm. But then they went and got these tattoos before we found out that Dylan had actually allegedly, according to Brett Payne, the lead investigator in the Idaho poor case that only has two years of experience, the little rookie in his PCA, he put on there that Dylan saw a person clad in black with bushy eyebrows. Every time I say bushy eyebrows, I think of Sesame Street and Oscar the Grouch. I mean, it's not an identification of any kind. Sully Spirit says exposing themselves. And that's what I'm asking. You nailed it, Sully. Are they exposing hidden knowledge? This is, this is very interesting to me. It, why not put it in alphabetical order? You know, it would be E-K-M-X. E-K-M-X. What's the difference? Why not put it in alphabetical order? But no, they put it in the exact order of the deaths 
as they occurred. And so it really bugs me. It begs the question, how would they know the order of the deaths unless they heard more than a dog barking, unless they know more than they're telling us, right? Which is nothing. They haven't told us anything. And that S, you say, yet Steve said they didn't have to go upstairs. Doesn't make sense then. And this is the order chosen. And it, it really bothers me. It just bothers me. I wanted to hear more about that timeline. As much about the timeline and the house as we could. And so I did look this up. And I'm going to play it here for you. It is... What could they have done to be more safe? Yeah, lock the door perfectly. Yeah. No, it's Moscow. I know it's, it's safe. I, I wonder it's about the door because I, Kaylee was a door locker. She, she come told here. Us. And so I, I, I question that all the time. Like, why wasn't the door locked? Why wasn't the door locked? What? Why wasn't the door locked? Why wasn't the door locked? And then I remembered hearing in the very beginning, right out of Cheap Bry's mouth, somebody asked, were the doors locked when you got there? Were the bedroom doors locked when you got there? And I'm going to look and find it. And he said, well, yes, the doors were locked. And I sat there thinking, how in the hell did they get in the rooms dead then? So what do you guys think? So Militia says wasn't be up told that she would not be arrested if she came back to Idaho to give evidence. My question is, why would she be arrested anyway? Well, it was, it gets convoluted, but it had to do with a subpoena. If you don't follow up and submit to a subpoena, you can get charged. And so I believe, to the best of my knowledge, that's what that was about. All right, you guys, the puppies are playing. They're knocking my computer around. But yeah, listen to the way the mom says this. Like, this is going to be something on her mind forever. I feel this is very, very important. I'm going to play it one more time for you. I want you to listen up to how she says it. Read her body language. And it's just mystifying. And when you realize how weird that is, because Olivia is backing her up. Olivia is going, yeah, yeah, she is a door locker. So listen again to this. What could they have done to be more safe? Yeah, lock the door perfectly. Yeah. No, the, it's Moscow. I know it's, it's safe. I, I wonder it's, about the door because I, Kaylee was a door locker. She, she told me here. And so I, I, I question that all the time. Like, why wasn't the door locked? Why wasn't the door locked? I, I wonder it's, about the door because I, Kaylee was a door locker. She, she, she told me here. And so I, I, I question that all the time. Like, why wasn't the door locked? 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 That's sticking with me. That matters. Somebody had the key codes. I really feel it. And then, don't forget that the very next morning, we have the door wide open in the front. And according to the PCA, I believe, don't quote me, I don't remember where I read it, but I thought they said the slider was slightly open or, or unlocked or something. But the front door according to the neighbor, and I finally found it, um, it's on, you have to look up Box 13 Seattle. And um, all my links to everything I show you guys is pinned, not pinned, but in the description below. It will be pinned. Idaho murder slain university students. Neighbors say front door left wide open after tax. Now this was published on December 8th, 2022. The neighbor told Fox News this week that the front door, which opens to the level where two other roommates were unharmed, was wide open around 8.30 a.m. on November 13th. So it makes me really question, are we dealing with somebody that had a code to get in the house? And if so, how would Brian have gotten the house? And a lot of you have been questioning, how come he got a burglary charge? Did he break in? Anytime anyone enters a premises without permission that is you can get a burglary charge just by entering whether you broke anything or not just so you know cat h says M um was mom medicated to deal with the tragedy i don't know that'd be private you know hippa loves i'd need to be truthfully i they'd have to sedate me for about a couple years Virgo 22 says it could have been left open since 4 a.m. or 3 a.m., right? We don't know. That's a big question. So if the killers knew the dog and they opened, they, they used the code, they got in the house, they left the door open and they committed a crime and then they went out, 
would they have tracked Matt Murphy all the way back in the house and then went all the way upstairs and locked him in a room? Yet Murphy would have no blood on him. It couldn't happen that way. So Murphy had to have been locked in that room prior to the murders to keep him from having any, like, blood on him or any mess on him, right? Scott Stuff says, hello, Mama D and family. I was just thinking. Imagine all the conversations that tattoo will start. Those girls don't even want to talk to police. Why tattoo this knowing people will ask? That, wow, hold on, we're pinning it. Why draw attention to yourself? I mean, why not get in a place where it's private to you? Like on the inside of your your shirt. You know, I mean, on your, you know... On your tummy, on your chest, on your back. Uh, I don't know. But why have it right there where everybody's going to see it if you don't want attention? That's a great question. Storm Dancer says, Bethany may be afraid because Section 19-4301A, Idaho State Legislation, could be why. It is a long, but Parts 2 and 3 could apply. You would think so, wouldn't you? Sarah Fagan says, shouldn't there be blood on the doors when they left the house? Or the window sills? Or outside <laughs> I mean somewhere Shelly says you know how prisoners get teardrops this is what I thought of as soon as I saw this tattoo oh wow Donna McQuaid says wasn't one of the roommates seen smoking outside at 8 30 that morning by a neighbor who got footage allegedly yes allegedly that individual is working with the defense but it could be all YouTube rumors we don't have proof but allegedly I also thought it was weird, really weird. Not only was that front door open when Kaylee's a door locker, we have the the siblings were called before 911. So this comes from Inside Edition. And as I said, all links are supplied in the description. It says, a source tells Inside Edition Digital that the two surviving roommates called Chapin's two siblings Hunter and Maisie, who also attended the University of Idaho, to come to the home before calling police. Are you kidding me? I'm numb to that. There is no way in hell I would call a family member before 911. I can't even fathom that. I don't care how stupid you are. Your family member is going to do nothing but brick the hell out and complicate the situation. Oh my golly. I mean, seriously, what? These roommates are really getting to me. Wow, why didn't the siblings call 911? We don't know who called 911. We only know that the roommate's phone was used inside the home to call 911, but the roommates had left the home. That's all we know. Okay, let, yeah, it does feel cold-hearted to me. It just, why on earth would you call? I, I can't. When I say you can't, my mind just stops, you guys. I'm like, that couldn't happen. Who would do that? Robin Davis Duxworth said, I also heard that it's not Bethany, but Dylan and the other housemates that wasn't there, supposedly. Storm Dancer says, failure to notify L.A. and Corner shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and shall be punished by up to one year in county jail or fined up to a thousand or by both. Thank you, Storm Dancer, for that. It doesn't seem right in any way we package this. It all comes up a turd in a bucket. It stinks to high heaven. Cindy Noob says reeks of betrayal and also many more horrific things. Dogma, I read DM called Hunter Johnson. I believed they kept mixing him up with Hunter Chapin. Johnson supposedly called 911 for an unconscious person. Well, I don't know because I did hear from the Chapin family that the siblings did go to the home. So I don't think there's a mix-up. I think both hunters may have went. You guys, we hit over 17,000 subscribers. I want to say I am so thankful for you and for all of your friends and all of your family and all of the others that have supported because you matter. And as a group, we matter. And we're that much stronger of a voice. And we're doing wonderful work. So I just appreciate you guys so incredibly much. Storm Dancer says, any person who, with the intent to prevent discovery 
of the manner of unalivings, fails, or delays to notify Ellie or coroner shall be guilty of a felony, shall be imprisoned for no more than 10 years and or $50,000. Why is that not happening? What kind of deal got made in the background? That's what I want to know. Cindy Newbelt says, I heard the sister was chosen as a sweetheart or something, and that the brother or both got scholarships. Lovely. Maisie did get chosen as Sigma Chi's sweetheart. And you're right on the other count as well, because the brother, which is Hunter Chapin, did get a scholarship. So, lovely, lovely. I feel you. It's kind of like, okay, you know, the narcissist after a big blow up, you know, and they've done something horrible. The narcissist always, you know, love bombs you, right? Just saying how I feel. That's right. We are a lot of light workers and truth tellers. That's absolutely true, Lee McKenna. That'll never change. All right, you guys, let's, let's get into the next slide. Let's slide on in. For, I, I tried to pick topics on this for us that we've all had questions about. Where the hell are Ethan Chapin's golf clubs? Really after the Idaho Four crimes, the LE was leading the charge very quickly to remove belongings from the VIX and give them back to their families. And Chief Fry led the crusade by packing everything up in U-Haul trucks, and he was actually drove one of the U-Haul trucks. And then some of those items were returned to the VIX families. This was before the defense got involved, and, you know, that was suspect in itself. But E's parents kept talking about this expensive set of golf clubs that I guess were really important to him. In any case, they were important to him, but yet you see the footage of them coming out of the King Roadhouse, uh, you know, by one of the LE members going into a U-Haul truck. So those should have been turned over to the families because everything in those U-Haul trucks was obviously contaminated and wasn't used as evidence for whatever reason. It was just sent back to the parents, you know, and you can see in the video clips what they are, you know, the random items. OK, but the parents of E said in multiple interviews on TV that they, they never got back the golf clubs. And they said that they were sitting somewhere at the LE or at one of the stations. They never got them. And they were wondering if they're not considered evidence, where did they go? And that's a good question. Now, you can't really say they don't exist because they do. And you can see them in the footage here. I mean, I'm the, this is uh, a clip of the peeping LE when they came to the noise complaints to the house. And you can see there's the set of golf clubs. That's, and they're, they're the same set that the LE is bringing out and putting in the U-Haul truck. So they just fell into a black hole. They're not used as evidence. They're not considered an unalive weapon. Okay, that's fine. Where did they go and why did they disappear? Now, there is speculation that those golf clubs actually were used in the crimes. Now, for what purpose were they used as a defense weapon by them or by the perps? We don't know. But I think it's interesting that they kind of disappeared and no one knows what happened to them. Wow, right? So, I actually went and looked it up to see if she was right, and she was, true crime buff, and I've got all the links down below. This is a quote I got, actually, off of um, a little interview. For an update, anything we, Ethan, this is Ethan, um, Ethan Chapin's mom. She is saying this. This is a quote. For an update, anything we forward slash Ethan had is not frozen with the defense, said Chasey, Stacy Chapin, in, or Chapin, sorry, in a statement on social media. For us, it involves two vehicles, ease belongings, and a nice set of golf clubs. So why are the golf clubs missing? From what we know, that Ethan wasn't killed with a sharp-edged weapon, but like a sharp, blunt weapon. And I was like, was he killed with his own golf club? Plus other things. But I mean, could you kill somebody with an iron like that? That sucker's not going to bend, is it? I don't know. 
Right, Lee McKenna was a golf club used as a weapon. I was wondering that. And it's weird that they just disappeared. Susan Roscoe says, I think he had two sets of golf clubs. Well, what does that matter? They're still missing one. The point is, why are they missing? Because think about it. That's the same golf clubs the cops are carrying right there that are going in the back that were in that room. I'm asking the same question as Lee. Was it used on Ethan? Ivan Pool, Ethan's golf clubs were supposedly in his Jeep. The set brought out to the U-Haul were in a different bag that was pink and white, possibly Xana's. The picture on the screen is the exact set of golf clubs that were brought out of the house. And that is them. And they are black with orange. And if you look at the picture, when the cops are being peeping toms, you can see those two match. And those are the golf clubs we're talking about. For sure, for sure. But I have heard that Ethan had another set in his vehicle, too. So you could be right, Yvonne. You could be right. See, that's what I'm wondering, Lee. Me and Lee McKenna are on the same page on this one. She and I both have the same opinion. Possibly another piece of evidence. Gone. Susan Roscoe says, Moscow P PD has a tendency to lose things. Ooh. Cindy Newfeld says, maybe on display? That's horrifying. Cat H says, yep, could crack a skull. Mm. That makes me kind of freak out a little. Nani says, a broken golf club could be used to puncture stab wounds. That's true, too. Really has a mind going. The Canadian cat lady, hello and welcome back. You said the club could, have, could leave sharp, jagged cuts for sure. And isn't that what we heard? I've always wondered why Ethan's got so much detailed in the PCA, but then it's all retracted about the manner of death. Or is it just starting with Ethan and then it's going through them all, but it's retracted? I don't know. Who to London says they're frozen in time. <laughs> Gemini 65, I'm sure you can do some damage with them. I would imagine so too. I mean, that's horrifying to think of. Susan Roscoe says, like a broken golf club, if the handle is broken in half, could be used for deadly punctures. Oh, my gosh. Kamal says, he had a very expensive set of golf clubs, and I'm sure he kept them in a Jeep, where there was also so many people in and out of that house. If he kept them in a Jeep, would he kept his Jeep locked? Would the Jeep have been locked? Or could someone have grabbed a golf club? But why would they want to leave their DNA? Then again, I'm always thinking as if this person hasn't, you know, this attacker had never been in the house. So if this person's already been in the Jeep a thousand times and already been in the house a thousand times, they wouldn't even think nothing about it. Just open that back door and grab a club if it's not locked. But to me, I think the vehicles would be locked, wouldn't they? Joyful Dolphin encourages you, please leave your DNA on the like button for Mama D. Please and thank you, e -e -e, Dolphin. <laughs> You're so cute. Kohlberger never had a victim's ID. All right? <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm going to battle right now because my comments were full. Uh, there is to a connection. Kohlberger had one of the victim's IDs at his parents' house in a glove, in a box. And I'm like, y'all got it wrong. You've got it wrong. And I'm going to prove who lied to you about it. I'm going to show you who the hell lied to you and told you that Kohlberger had a victim's ID in a box. And not only am I going to show you how that, that they lied, I'm going to show you the proof that they lied and the proof that they knew that they were lying when they told you that. How's that one? Kohlberger never had the victim's ID. Let's start here. First of all, I'm going to play you a little thing. This is from fox13seattle.com. All right. And this is the unsealed search warrant. If Kohlberger had those IDs, don't you think that Fox 13 Seattle would have said that? Don't you think they would have been like, the headline would have been like, you know, suspect had victims' IDs. Well, let's see what they really say. 
evidence concealed in the Idaho student murders, and the filing includes a list of the evidence seized. The warrant was served at Brian Koberger's parents' house in Pennsylvania, where he was arrested seven weeks after the slayings. Koberger is accused of killing four University of Idaho students in the middle of the night back in November. He drove back home with his father in December. Now, during Koberger's arrest, investigators took away a number of items, including medical-style gloves, a flashlight, a black sweatshirt, and size 13 Nike sneakers. So, Brian don't wear a size 10 bands, does he? Now, during Koberger's arrest, investigators took away a number of items, including medical-style gloves, a flashlight, a black sweatshirt, and size 13 Nike sneakers. What happened to the IDs of the victims? Hmm, not there. Let's look. This is the actual, this is the actual evidence listed. Number 35, ID cards. ID cards inside glove, inside a box. ID cards. That's it. That is all anybody ever heard. IDs, ID cards. Whose? Were they Brian's? Because I have a ton of my old IDs, my college IDs, my library ID, um, different little hotel IDs, all in a little tiny, what do you call it? I don't know, a little velvety bag that I have in my jewelry box. And that would be listed as ID cards inside glove inside a box. So what? He put it in a glove. Who cares? Listen to this. Want to know who lied to you? Let's listen. Pay attention. This is this is 101 bullshit. It's very big. It's so powerful because now there is absolutely no explanation for why he would have an ID from somebody in that house. And recall on the search warrant number 35 from the house that was searched of his parents, it lists IDs in a glove in a box, not in a glove compartment, in a glove in a box in the house. So she herself just stated what it actually said. What did she say it said? ID cards, inside glove, inside box. Nowhere does it say anywhere on there about it being any victims, anything, which is bullshit. So we're going to rewind this and uh, we're going to play Mrs. Cop and Dagger's bullcrap again. It's very big. It's so powerful because now there is absolutely no explanation for why he would have an ID from somebody in that house. And recall on the search warrant number 35 from the house that was searched of his parents, it lists IDs in a glove in a box, not in a glove compartment, in a glove in a box in the house. Mm, right. So what kind of evidence might they have, do you think, on the st cyber stalking side of this and how significant is that? It's significant to me because what it does is it shows the connection of stalking physically that we know about through the phone pings, 12 of them in and around that house, and now we have possible cyber stalking. Why do people stalk? They stalk because they feel mistreated, they feel persecuted, and that's the same reason they kill. So this is a direct correlation, I believe. Yeah, okay, Jennifer. It's Everybody has a dog in the fight. The prosecution obviously has a dog in the fight. And this is Bulldog Jennifer. Look at the face. Look at that face. She's got the bulldog, right? All it said, Jennifer, is ID cards inside glove, inside box. Why do you got to lie about it? Why do you got to come out here and ruin your own credibility so that everybody that sees your face thinks, okay, so you're obviously paid by the prosecution to come out here and just say bullshit any way you like and not be held accountable. Well, you just got held there. I called you out. Don't lie to us. We don't like it. Whew, I had to get off that page. I can't look at her face. I can't see her. She makes me want to spank her face. She makes me want to spank her face. Yeah. Who says they don't even say alleged? Thank you. Thank you, lovely. So true. Yeah. Who also says that she said BK had a kill kit. Right? She is so full of crap. She just literally makes crap up. And to your family says, maybe those IDs for, for making fake IDs. Who knows? Who knows? It could be right.
Susan Roscoe says people think it was strange for his father to fly out to drive him back with him, but BK had visual snow condition. I would have had to do it for my son. Well, the nighttime driving and the length of driving is would be the hard part. And at, I think I was about 32. I was going down to see my folks, and we got bad weather of ice and so forth and carried on. And pretty soon I called my dad because it was such a long trip. I wanted him to meet me halfway, bring my mom. And with three of us, I could get some sleep, and we could take turns driving. So I get it. I get it. <laughs> some militia said, ugh, cop and dodger. <laughs> Yeah, beating the narrative, spreading the narrative. That's right, Cindy Newfeld. That's right. That's right. I can't stand her either, Gemini 65. Nettie says, wasn't it said that's how they identified them all was by their IDs? Bam! Thank you, Nettie. Thank you. Excellent. You get the, you get a star. Bellin says, heard BF did not get matching tattoo with the M. It was DM and Hunter J's girlfriend, Emily, her party bud who lived at 1122 year before. I pick up them with Taz. Think BF took off that same day. You could be right, Bellin. You could be. You're, you're right on a lot of that stuff. I will have to do, I will have to do some more research. I may have assumed that it was Bethany and it could have been someone else, but I know it was Dylan, right? Noni says, I had heard that the plans for Brian's dad to fly out and drive back with him were his plans that were made months in advance. Do you know if that is true or not? I do not know. I do not know. I've got one more topic. Let's do it. Let's just do it. We're getting pretty late here in the in the hour, but we're going to end on this topic. All right. When were the bodies removed? We've been working on it for a week. I've got the answer. Thank God I've got the answer. Are you ready? So first, everybody and their brother sent me this video, and I'm going to share it for you. I want you to know this video wasn't taken until December 30th. So we both know that is not the bodies being removed, but... So I'm going to let you know ahead of time this is not the bodies being removed. This is them doing cleanup and painting in the home that four quadruple homicides occurred before the FBI has even been in the home to do that laser sighting or any of that before there's even a trial date set. This is December 30th. Wasn't Brian arrested December 30th? Isn't this the same day he was arrested or am I wrong? So this is what everybody sent me. And everybody tried to make me feel like I was just silly as could be because I wouldn't accept this as uh, the bodies being removed. I'm like, no, you guys, I got a hundred of you sending me this. I promise you, this is not the bodies being removed. This, this was also sent to me. You can see the little blood on the stool, but this actually was not tarped either. This was a tarp over furniture, not the building, and that was the red tarp people sent me. That was the same day. And then this was people telling me. I actually had somebody send me this. And um, they said that this was them carrying the body bags. I about fell off my chair. I'm like, this is not body bags, you guys. What the hell? But somebody else told me that they just stacked all four victims on a gurney and wheeled them right off that back patio door. And I'm like, why are people making up stuff? All right, here we go. <laughs> it was the same week. Listen to this. So it's, it's fascinating that I'm, I'm reading that the uh, DNA testing is still to come, that those bodies are going to go to a crime lab for DNA testing. But we are, you know, this is Sunday uh, that this happened. We're multiple days since and there's a killer on the loose. I'm curious as to why the DNA testing hasn't happened already. Well, the bodies have been released to the families. The DNA testings were... Um, I mean, things from the crime scene have been sent to uh, forensic labs for DNA testing. And then there were lots of swabs that were uh, taken at the autopsies, as well as fingernail clippings, um, their clothing. All of those things have been taken to the forensic lab for the DNA testing. That's where it would come from. And that, that doesn't, uh, it usually takes a long time, but when there's an exigent circumstance like this, it's often expedited. Do you expect that these results will come back quickly? Again, there is a killer on the loose, so to know that DNA result would be critical. 
Right. And I don't know the time frame, but yes, it's all being expedited. There's lots of um, Idaho State Police Forensic Lab and the FBI. And so they have all been uh, transported in there. They're working on those things. Um, I don't know the time frame for that. Ms. Mabbitt, we, we showed a picture a moment ago of um, a, a wall on the outside of the house. It looked like the foundation on the outside of the house. I'm going to ask the control room to, to put that picture up again. This was fairly shocking to see. It's blood dripping um, on the outside of the house, almost as though it may be seeping from the inside. Does that sound congruent with the results um, of the crime scene that you were able to ascertain from your work? Um, from my observations, yes. And can you tell me if that means that this might have been one of the uh, bedrooms uh, or where, where the beds were, that one of the uh, victims was stabbed, this, this particular area of the house? I think that's pretty likely, yes. Is there anything else, any other information you can shed on that, on that uh, particular scene? So, somebody was in that bed in that room, in Zana's room. I'm just saying. Because she has stuck with that story all along. And so to me, that means somebody was in that bed. And if they saw Zana laying on the floor, in my opinion, there's something wrong with the story that we've all heard about Ethan blocking that door unless some bodies were moved. I'm just saying. Nani says MSN has become overpaid professional liars. MSN is direct, definitely not what it was back in my day. Fallon says we were told it was B up and DM. That got matching tasks. Just recently, I saw a picture. It was Emily, not the app. Susan Rusco says, I don't think Judge can place a gag order on the media. I don't think so either. I think that it, we have to just learn to discern. And that's why I started switching into this more or less digging things out and and seeing what is true so that we can put like a uh, stock in in something go okay this is it's like we're in this field of mud in this case and everywhere we look it's just mud and we have to figure out where can we put the stake you know where is going to be a solid place to put a stake on the ground on something we can have sure footing on but they they continuously change the narrative and expect us to just whimsically go oh yeah okay and blindly follow them on the narrative changes, but we don't, and we're not going to, because the the you know the evidence should speak for itself. It should tell the story, not what the police say, not what some some cop and dagger says, not what I say. But the evidence should speak for the victims. The problem is the evidence can only tell the story when it's collected and the person does their job right. And so right away I can tell you when you have inadequate, trained, or even biased where they've locked into something and they absolutely feel this person is guilty or whatever, or they're trying to protect someone, you get an ex a very a skewed interpretation of evidence. It just gets backwards. Why would they do this cleanup before any investigation? Interior, you're nailing it tonight. Excellent question. Why would they do this cleanup before any investigation? And yeah, we're going to hear, well, there was asbestos. There were people going in and out of that place without a mask all the time. After, before, it didn't matter. So Militia says, in my opinion, it's all just a big cover up for the real perps. I don't think BK did it he's just a passy okay let's continue here we've got one more thing that's going to nail the exact date was november 16th right out of chief fry's mouth now keep in mind this is a presser on november 16th three days after the crime occurred and he tells you that the bodies are no longer in the house during this presser listen close the facts of the case that we know right now. We know that these homicides occurred in the early morning hours of Sunday, November 13th. Around noon, Moscow officers received a call of an unconscious person. Officers discovered the bodies of Ethan Chapin, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Goncavs inside the residence on King Road. The four were stabbed with a knife, but no weapon has been located at this time. 
There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. Investigators are continuing to collect evidence at the scene. Investigators are working to develop a timeline to relevant events. Autopsies are taking place today on all the victims so we can continue to gather evidence and solve the crime. Investigators are working to follow up on all leads and to identify a person of interest. Based on details at the scene, we believe this was an isolated, targeted attack on our victims. We do not have a suspect at this time, and that individual is still out there. So, November 16th, three days after, so they had to remove the bodies, probably prior to even the press conferences, before news was contacted. I'm pretty sure they took care of everything before we even have a camera on site. So... That's crazy to me, how quickly they did. Lee McKenna says, they also destroyed the biggest piece of the evidence after painting. Yeah, why clean it and paint it if you're just going to tear it down? What's a real story? Okay, here we go. Last thing for tonight. So, there's been a lot of, of talk that there was no blood between the rooms. And I'm like, I don't believe that, y'all. I can't believe that. So I had to look it up. So right away, I went over here to this little post, and they said the same thing. Contained scene. This might be where you guys got that info from, but I assure you it's not true. So just hold on. Says, I just listened to an ABC podcast that said the murder scenes were strangely contained, meaning no blood was tracked to any other area of the house. Does this mean the murder changed booties between rooms and put them in his backpack? Okay, well, let's go over here. Now, this was published on January 20th, 23, and it says details redacted from the affidavit filed in Idaho were revealed and documents unsealed in Washington State. And this comes from another Reddit, but we're going to get the real deal. So just hold on. The four University of Idaho students slain in November were attacked with such force that there was significant blood spatter and cast off throughout the Idaho home where the bodies were found, according to court records. So if you continue. Oh, I'm sorry. That was actually an inside edition. Chris Sparrow. Spargo. OK, here we go. The murder scene is revisited later in the document when Baker explains why he wishes to search the Kohlberger apartment. Quote, The King Road residence contained a significant amount of blood from the victims, including spatter and cast off, blood stain pattern resulting from blood drops released from objects due to its motion which, based on my training, makes it likely that this evidence was transferred to Koberger's person, clothing, or shoes. So, this guy that got this warrant to go into Koberger's apartment with Don Daniels um, from Pullman or whatever, they're expecting to find cross-transfer of DNA from the victims to Koberger's and so forth. Right? But they didn't. In fact, the DNA says, the DNA says, hey, let the DNA talk, right? <laughs> Here, let's try that again. Ann Taylor, the defense says, there is no explanation for the total lack of DNA evidence from the victims in Mr. Kohlberger's apartment, office, home, or vehicle, public defender Ann Taylor said in the filings. So, his evidence or his experience didn't take him in the right direction with Kohlberger then, did they? Let's listen to what this guy says. Now, this happens to be on um, News Nation, who one of our favorite channels, but actually this dude, he makes some good points, and I wanted to share it with you. The problem that the prosecution's got is that the prosecution is now going to be arguing, hey, there's no cell phone evidence that ties him to the location. Hey, there's no DNA that ties him to location other than touch on the sheath. Hey, we don't have any triangulation. And hey, he must have cleaned it up, even though we know he was in and out of there in a time period, as you might remember, Chris, that is getting increasingly compressed. And 
hey, by the way, we didn't, we, we sealed the records in this case, or we asked the judge to seal the records because we thought there were other suspects, and lo and behold, what do we learn now? That there are not one, but two unidentified male specimens that arguably are at the scene. Doesn't that make you go, what? So they go through all the hell to to tell us that, yeah, they're expecting to find all this cross transfer from the victims all over the place, whether it's in his car, his office, his apartment, all that. And when they don't find it, they're like, well, he had plenty of time to clean up. But yet we have two unidentified male DNAs. And don't tell me that they don't have some testing done on them. Or how would they know they were male? Thank you to the 1111 that pointed that out to me. Because obviously they tested them to get that much. So there's enough DNA to figure out who the hell they are. Why are we not finding that out? Especially if the evidence is not pointing us or leading us in a breadcrumb right to Kohlberger. Then we need to broaden our view and get the hell out of this tunnel so that our view is wide enough to consider it could be a different suspect. And if so, you need to get in, like on top of that, get ahead of that before this shit blows up in your face because truth will do that it will blow up right in your face doc terry says yes like quicksand and we are not stupid amen this crime will be solved by youtube reporters in my humble opinion you could be right at this point felon says E's mom said 2 a.m is always the darkest time for their family that is true she does say that there are certain things that stay with me in the case and that's one for sure Kim Barnier says, I think because nothing about removal of the bodies, because they took them out the night through the back slider door and through that back parking lot. You could be very right. I did do a lot of researching and I found a lot of locals that put that what they were told. So I didn't bring it up as fact or anything because it's hearsay. But the locals are telling us that the very night um, after the coroner got there, the coroner did go there. She was there around 5 o'clock. I did find her stating that she did not go there right away. She did not go until after 5. Now, after everybody got done, they may have been removed that night in the dead of night with a tent, quiet, with respect, and I'm all for that. I just find it so strange that there was nobody that took a photograph, but at least we can lay it to rest. To the best of our ability, because we would have no way to prove anything else. But they had to come out somehow. So that makes as much sense as I can come up with. Beverly Fox says, I figured out that Jennifer Coppendagger wasn't honest very soon after the unalivings. Yeah, she is the bulldog for the prosecution, I believe. I believe there are paid crisis workers that go out and their job is to put out propaganda that sways you to um, see Brian Kohlberger or whoever the state isn't, you know, invested all this money into. Face it, if they put money into something, it's an investment to them. And they are spending a lot of money to prosecute Brian Kohlberger, to prosecute, you know, each state has their person. Um, if you go over Indiana, it's Richard Allen. The state is investing, so therefore that's their investment. And they're going to protect their investment in a sense that they want to be, they want on face value to be trusted. And so therefore, they're going to go to the wall that this is who it is. And they're going to stay with it no matter what the evidence says. And that is not a fair trial. And we can only pray that there's a small miracle that one juror, one juror has a lick of common sense. That's all it'll take. That'll, that's it. That's all it'll take. If you're enjoying the content and you're enjoying our family, please hit that like button. Show us your love. We do appreciate you. Patricia Parker says, look at Kaylee's chubby little belly. Maybe she was pregnant. No, not meaning to be rude. You know, I've been wondering that too, Patricia. I looked at all the pictures. She put on weight kind of quick at the end. That really does bother me. And I don't normally go that route. But the proof is in the pudding that she did put on some weight real quick at the very end like you can look at it just months before and she's then her jawline's narrow you, it, the way olivia did like all of a sudden olivia had like this little face her sister and then poof she popped up and the next video she was a little bit pu puppy right because she was pregnant then she had the baby and she's thin again so i will say that that 
that has me a little bit in the back of my head here. Is it possible Kayla was pregnant? I don't either. Interior Family Studios is asking. Well, not asking, but expressing, saying, yeah, I don't understand why they did all the cleaning and then a demolition. Nani says, definitely something wrong with painting a crime scene where pieces of walls and floors were cut out. And that they're going to destroy it makes no sense. Who Delenda says, I keep thinking the same thing too. Maybe the surviving roommates let in the assailant, allegedly. You know, Huda, you and I have been thinking a lot alike. Oh, wait, I only have one more slide here, and we'll do it. And that is, whose DNA was actually on Ethan's golf clubs? I want to know, because they're missing. They're gone. Whose DNA would have been taken out of the evidence, in a sense? Just wondering. All right, my lovely Luz, you are incredible. You are amazing. Um... I appreciate everything you do for me, for the channel, for the family, um, for each other. You take such good care of each other. And though we are doing wonderful in chat, it is a little over an hour and I don't like to go too long. Make sure and hit that like button. And if you want more content from your 11 True Crime family, just hit that little bell so that way you know when we upload. I will see you again very, very soon. Love you to the moon and back. Oh, <laughs>